Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 presents a world in which two paths, one foolish and one wise, both lead to the same outcome. Where temporal human eyes see the benefits of wisdom, the preacher exposes folly. Where men see failure and assume folly, the preacher proclaims great dignity, but not always, he argues, since the reverse is often true. So how is man to judge? What is man to do? The answer, my friend, is not blowing in the wind. It's handed down in the content of scripture, open only to those who surrender themselves to its pages. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 80 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Richard, we are dealing with Ecclesiastes chapter 10. One of the things we're trying to wrestle with as we read this book, you can never take any portion of Ecclesiastes out of context. Right. You really have to take it as a whole. So then how do you balance this section versus another section? If in one section he's talking about the importance of wisdom, and another section it looks like, wisdom does not lead to anything, what are you going to do to reconcile those? And how do you bring those into a single context that is meaningful and can take into consideration all the different parts? And so you and I were wrestling trying to understand how Ecclesiastes chapter 10 works, realizing also that chapters were something much later than the text. One doesn't have to follow the chapters if one doesn't want to. These were not part of the original text. These are a medieval invention. So how do we want to reconcile this with what we've been seeing? And a lot of what we've been seeing is that there is this grand scheme that is the scaffolding of the universe. And while eternity is in man's heart, he cannot grasp it. We can perceive that there's some sort of scaffolding there, but we don't know what it is. And so how do we then understand how one's day-to-day actions, even one's last day, the completeness of one's life. How do those fit into the universe? Well, and there's a trick, right? Because it seems in some sections of the book that the fear of the Lord is being presented as your escape route from this folly of vanity. But at the same time, he doesn't let up pressure. He does not let you off the hook. In chapter 10, you're still wallowing around in this kind of meaninglessness. And I think it's because we're being trained that what we understand as the fear of the Lord and what we understand as a beneficial outcome of the fear of the Lord is wrong. Right, and you brought up the great example of the resurrection. The resurrection is not supposed to give you comfort that everything's on track. It's supposed to disrupt your understanding that everything is on track by seeing the Son of God killed or the Messiah killed or whatever your interpretation is, He's dead and cursed. And so how do you understand this to fit into a broader scheme? This is the paradox that forces us to rely on the Lord, fear of the Lord, so that we can understand that there's something bigger going on. Human beings have a tendency, Christians today have a tendency, to remake the resurrection in their image. Just like those hearing Ecclesiastes are constantly battling with the preacher to try to remake wisdom in their image. And whenever you remake wisdom in your image, it ceases to be what Paul, in 1 Corinthians, when he's shaming the Hellenists, refers to as the wisdom of God. So there's a tension. Paul didn't invent this tension in 1 Corinthians. It came from the biblical tradition that he received. So I think, in this sense, it's really important to let yourself be manipulated by the text and don't try to quickly find a way out of the hopelessness that the preacher is presenting. I think what you say bears repeating. Allow yourself to be manipulated by the text. The text is trying to remake and manipulate our presuppositions and our assumptions and our observations. 
And so I'm going to say it again. Be manipulated by the text. Allow yourself to be manipulated by the text. That's what faith is. Faith is trust. Faith is surrender. If you make a decision as someone who is baptized or a Muslim or a Jew who receives this text as being a canonical text, you have to be willing to just hear the text and cast aside your reservations, your fears, and your dogmatic beliefs that impede your faith, really. I mean, those beliefs that you bring to the text undermine faith. Faith is placing your trust in something. In this case, what we accept and claim to be the word of God. So let's begin there. Dead flies, any section that begins with the word dead flies, that's exciting. Nothing brings death to the forefront like dead flies. Forget the latest Avengers movie that I took my son to see this week. Let's talk about dead flies. Dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. No matter how beautiful the thing you make is, it just takes a little bit to ruin the whole batch. A wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. There's the wise path and there's the foolish path. And this sounds very much like the wisdom tradition we would read in Proverbs and from Psalms. Everyone wants to be on the right path and also realize heart here means mind. So when you decide a wise brain sets you on the right, a foolish brain sets you on the left. I would suggest that he's talking about two vectors here that lead to folly within the context of this book. He doesn't talk about vanity here, but I believe he'll talk about folly later in chapter 10. But the point is, if both vectors take you nowhere, is there a third vector that pertains to the fear of God? This is a question for the broader text. Is there a third vector that pertains to the fear of God that goes somewhere that God intends, but that you can't see because of your vantage point as someone who has eternity set in his heart but can't grasp it. Right, and this is where taking it in the context is so important because if we read this in Proverbs, being on the right path is clearly better than being on the left path. However, in the context of Ecclesiastes, we know precisely where both paths are leading. They're both leading to the grave. As we read through this section, I start thinking about traditions of honor and shame. Traditions that are part of who I am because of where my parents are from in the world. And people are very concerned about saving face in shame and honor cultures. You never want to appear to be weak. You never want people to know when you're sick. You never want them to know anything about you that would undermine your standing in public. And then you think about Ecclesiastes and you think about the crucifixion and how Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, is publicly shamed. Now, for those of us who accept human paradigms of honor and shame, victory and loss, of embarrassment and vindication, it's very difficult to see what's happening in the crucifixion. But it seems to me that what's happening in the crucifixion is a validation of what the preacher is saying here. Because since we know that no matter which path you choose, the outcome isn't guaranteed in terms of material gain or material well-being, Who's to say that Jesus is the loser because he's the loser? Again, there's a third vector, which is the fear of the Lord. Jesus could have won. We know from the text that he lost. But the preacher's suggesting, in my mind, would it have mattered either way so long as he feared the Lord? Even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. So while you're walking, it's clear that your steps betray your mind and your thinking. If the ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure allays great offenses. This is something that is extremely useful in corporate life. This is something that's extremely useful when dealing with any authority figure. And it gets back to our general paradigm for dealing with authority, no matter what its stance relative to you as an individual. Just keep your cool. Keep your head. Don't fight back. Don't react. Don't abandon your duties. There's always benefit from keeping your post and keeping your head. And this is already bringing in these kinds of undermining ideas. Just because you're acting wisely doesn't mean the rulers are going to be happy with you. Again, Jesus conducted himself with extreme wisdom when dealing with Pontius Pilate and the Sanhedrin. What did it get him? Now, it served a purpose according to God's will, but what did it get Jesus? Now I think we're getting to the heart of the matter. And the more we work through this text, the more convinced I am that it is fully integrated with the broader message of the biblical 
system, the biblical canon. There is an evil I have seen under the sun like an arrow which goes forth from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places while rich men sit in humble places. For all you Republicans who believe that you do an honest day's work and you get what you deserve, God is going to decide what you deserve. This is usurping man's place on the judgment seat. Just because you have it doesn't mean you deserve it. And just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good. So you have material success, so what does that make Jesus? What does that make the 60 million refugees wandering the earth today while we maintain relatively low gas prices? What does that mean? What did you achieve? All it means is that there is folly in exalted places. I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land. Everything's upside down. Oh my goodness, there are welfare recipients driving new cars. Well, I, the poor rich prince, have to work every day. It's so difficult. What about the people who have to walk five miles to get a glass of water? It's exposing, I think, the entitlement mentality and flipping everything on its head. In both six and seven, it's showing that your eyes can betray you. Just because you see someone powerful does not mean they're wise. Just because you see someone weak does not mean they're not wise. And just because you work hard, it doesn't mean you're assured of anything. Because in verse 8, he who digs a pit may fall into it, and a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. So you're working hard, you dig the pit, you break through a wall, you flex your muscles, and guess what? You get bit, you yeah. get stung, you fail, something terrible happens. Just think if the Shawshank Redemption, as soon as he dug through that wall, the next thing that happened is... The tunnel collapses on him and he dies. Yes, and it goes on. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits logs may be endangered by them. Don't put your trust in the work of man's hands. This is pure Torah here in verse 8 and 9. I think he's explaining to you the underlying mechanisms of Torah. We know that we're instructed not to put our trust in the work of man's hands, in the work of our own flesh. And now he's just explaining to you how merciful God is in prescribing that instruction. As a wise father, he's protecting his children from their own stupidity. If you put all your faith in what you can achieve, that's what you're going to get. He's using observation to undermine common wisdom. Well, if you work hard, everything's going to work out. No, if you work hard, your own work could kill you. John Henry did not get a lot out of battling against the steam hammer. If the axe is dull and he does not sharpen its edge then he must exert more strength. Okay, so now he's switching gears here. You, at the same time, have to be diligent in what you're doing. You can't just start chopping wood without sharpening the ax. So you can't say, well, if I might have logs fall on me, why should I split logs? You can't say that because in the next verse he's saying, look, don't split logs without sharpening your ax. So make sure that you use your wisdom to do what you're doing well, like we saw in the last chapter. If you're going to do something, do it hard, do it well, do it with wisdom, but don't expect what the results are going to be. Right, because if you don't do it wisely, you'll end up having to exert more strength. As he says here in verse 10, wisdom has the advantage of giving success. So if you set out to do a thing, you have to do it with all your might, as we heard in the previous section. At the same time, you have to do it mightily walking in wisdom. And part of walking in wisdom is understanding that the purpose of digging a pit or breaking through a wall is not digging a pit or breaking through a wall. These things are not an end in themselves. There's an inherent tension. Human beings have a kind of tunnel vision. They set out to do a thing, and that thing becomes the end in itself. But how can something that you perceive from a temporal point of view be an end in itself that doesn't lead to vanity? You no, know, it reminds me of a story I heard recently about farmers in California right now, nut farmers, where there's no water, and so there's a race to take as much water as possible in order to grow the most nuts, which take a lot of water. And the faster they can do it, the faster they can run their wells dry, the faster they can make money before their neighbors can get to the water. So the more diligently they work, the more they try to make a living, the more they're ending it for the next generation. If the serpent bites before being charmed, so this is an interesting verse, Butt it up against your example, Richard, because if the serpent bites before being charmed, there's no profit for the charmer. So you can't just have tunnel vision and, you know, break through the wall and then everything collapses on you, as you were describing. But at the same time, you can't be too slow 
Because if your job is to charm a snake and you don't get your job done, you're going to get bit and you're going to die. So again, it's playing on this concept of finding the middle path, but the middle path doesn't necessarily lead to success ultimately from your perspective. The middle path just safeguards you along the way. Don't be too slow. Don't be too fast. Don't be overambitious, but don't be lazy. But even if you take that path, you're not guaranteed anything. Right. That's the key because you're still on one of the two material vectors of worldly success or worldly failure. But really, from God's perspective, there's no difference. That's why God can look at the crucified Lord and see his victory on the cross, and we can't. This is, I think, what Paul is arguing in the New Testament. Words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious, while the lips of a fool consume him. It's good to use your words wisely. It's good to speak from the perspective of wisdom. When you speak from the perspective of wisdom, you are gracing those around you because they benefit from your speech. When the wise man speaks, he's serving those around him. When the fool speaks, he's consuming himself and helping no one. The beginning of his talking is folly, and the end of it is wicked madness. So again, the wise man offers grace when he speaks wisdom, the fool destroys himself, and for those who listen to his words, he sets them on a path of wicked madness. Yet the fool multiplies words. I can just hear the preacher saying, this is an evil under the sun. So we know it's better to have gracious words from God's instruction than it is to speak foolish words from the heart of man. But the problem in verse 14 is that the words of man are the ones that multiply upon the earth. No man knows what will happen and who can tell him what will come after him. So the fool keeps multiplying words, but how can you make him stop? Because you don't know whether these words are actually foolish in the end or how foolish they will be. You don't know because there's plenty of foolish people the preacher has seen exalted in high places. Maybe his foolish words are going to get him a great job. Who knows? In literary criticism, there's this concept of the implied reader. And I think here there's an implied alternative. There's an implied antidote to the fool. It's not stated, but I think it's implied in the book itself because the preacher set out to write this book. So he's talking about the problem of the multiplication of foolish words, but he himself is setting out to write the wisdom of God and to give us instruction. So here, what I sense is a race against the multiplication of foolish words. And the preacher himself, in setting this book to page, is taking a risk that he doesn't know the outcome of his effort. Yet he himself is taking his own advice in writing this text and working with all his might for the sake of wisdom. Ultimately, you're not going to know if the words are foolish or wise unless you can see whether the result of them are gracious or whether they consume the fool. But ultimately, you're not going to be able to see that. It's going to be after you're dead. The preacher isn't going to see that. That's the point. I mean, how could someone writing all those centuries ago, imagine people sitting in Minnesota, which didn't even exist. I mean, Minnesota was the wilderness when this text was written. It was the unimagined, unreachable wilderness of the world when this text was written. How could he imagine that we'd be sitting here reading this text? and explaining it in a medium that's transmitted electronically to people around the world. Well, and every time you hear a famous author speak, they say, I had no idea that this book was going to become so popular. I just sat down and wrote, and it ends up that people really liked what I had to say. With this, you know, he sat down and he wrote, and how would he have known whether his words were going to be wise or whether ones of folly? Well, he wrote, like all of the biblical writers, on hope for the generation yet unborn, that we fight and we toil and we labor in Scripture, through Scripture, not for the sake of this generation or the younger generation, but for the generation yet to come. And in this sense, just by virtue of the fact that people are still struggling with Ecclesiastes all these centuries later, the preacher's hope has been fulfilled. But the burden of that hope is now on our shoulders because we have a responsibility, if there's something of value here, to study it, to explain it, and to ensure that it's passed on. The toil of a fool so wearies him that he does not even know how to go to a city. Here I feel a little bit at a disadvantage because without my GPS, I'm pretty much hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> right. I like how this contrasts with verse 10 about the axe being dull and it does not sharpen its edge. If you're a fool working extra hard to get so little done, whereas a wise person actually gets it done, the wise person is the one who puts their hand to the plow and works hard, but not dumb. Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad and whose princes feast in the morning. Isn't it terrible when you have a young, stupid king and you have 
a royal court who are interested in stuffing their faces. But blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility and whose princes eat at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. This reflects the middle path of wisdom. Ultimately, either trajectory, the trajectory of the foolish man or the wise man, it all leads back to the dust. But while you're on the path, if you practice this moderation, others will benefit from your wisdom. Because when you eat correctly, you'll work correctly. You eat for the sake of strength so you can do your work. You have wisdom for the sake of doing your work correctly you, and efficiently. And, and you, you govern correctly in the case of the princes and the nobility. And I think it's also fair to say that it's implied that if those who are powerful are not consuming everything for themselves, there's something left over for others. And this contrasts with verse 4, if the ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure lays great offenses. In order to have or be a wise ruler, one has to be moderate. One eats in order to have strength, not in order to get drunk. These examples of moderation that have come up in the text before don't point to gain for you. They point to the common good. They point to food for your brother, well-being for others. The words of a wise man earlier in this chapter are about grace for those around you. And I think this says something about what the fear of the Lord is about and what God's purpose is. It's not a self-involved purpose. I think the reason this text is so painful to hear is because we are, in our default setting as mammals, selfish. We don't want to look at anything from a perspective that doesn't involve us. We don't want to tell a story that we can't project our ego into. And scripture is a story that doesn't allow ego projection. Because even when you identify with the character, the character either becomes corrupt or loses in some terrible way. Ecclesiastes is going about this anti-ego, anti-idolatry tradition a little bit differently. He's just canceling you out. He's preaching. He's preaching the way you should preach. When you preach, there should not be a single ego in the assembly that can walk away feeling vindicated or feeling like they really appreciated your sermon and they agreed with you. Because if a human being can appreciate and agree with what you're saying, you might grow the population of your community, but you can't have been preaching scripture because scripture leaves you no oxygen for your own perspective, your own ego. It leaves you feeling like there's nothing you can do and there's no point. How can you build a community by leaving people with that feeling after the sermon? You can't. You as a human being can't. But what is the success you achieve if you do? Versus trusting in the fear of the Lord and allowing his instruction to achieve what it wants to achieve to your benefit or at your expense. It doesn't matter. And you can find examples in history of both where someone served the word of God and they benefited from it and where they served the word of God and they did not benefit from it. And that has no bearing on whether or not what they were doing was correct. This is impossible for people to accept. It is impossible for people to accept scripture because human beings cannot but measure another human being on anything other but worldly terms. And if you read Ecclesiastes, it's all, it's all cast aside. It's all undermined. Man cannot judge. This is what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees again and again in the Sermon on the Mount. How can you judge? How can you see what is pure and unpure? You have no ability to perceive what is pure and unpure. Something that looks filthy might be precious in the eyes of the Lord. So instead of trying to figure it out, O Pharisee, O Christian, just fear the Lord, trust in his ways and his instruction, and don't impose your temporary, vain, foolish perspective, which is passing away. Through indolence the rafters sag, and through slackness the house leaks. Don't be lazy. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. Here we see that even this path of ultimate austerity, even that gets undermined by the preacher. Have a nice meal, drink the wine, and enjoy it. And money can't buy happiness, but it certainly makes it easier. All these philosophies that indulge different aspects of the human ego, whether it's asceticism or self-indulgence. There's value sometimes in being austere. There's value sometimes in indulging. It's functional. Functional within the scope of eternity that human beings cannot see. So 
You just do what's in front of you. You do it well, you do it with conviction, you do it hard. Always stick to the work that you have in front of you, even if that work is enjoying yourself. Scripture is a flashlight that has a limited scope of view. You can see just the path in front of you. Who's in your way? What's in your way? What your options are within a certain limited scope. Beyond that, you can't say anything. So you can see how austerity and how indulgence function within that scope. And within that narrow scope, moderation seems to be, in some cases, the best way to walk along the path that God has prescribed. But you can't see how the wicked man's indulgence, which seems to you to be out of control and with no end in sight, you can't see if it has an end in sight, and you can't see what God's purpose is for it. And the best example, again, in the New Testament is Paul's letter to the Romans. This is exactly what he's telling the Jews about their sinfulness. There was no end in sight to your wickedness, O Israel, but thank God, because God used your wickedness to bring the Gentiles into the community of the Torah. But guess what? It doesn't mean you're off the hook for your wickedness, even though God made out of it something good. What does that sound like to me? It sounds like Ecclesiastes, like he's leaving them no oxygen. Yes, your drunkenness was okay, but it was not okay. So which is it, Paul? I don't know. Let's ask the preacher. Maybe he can tell us which it is, O Israel. Furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse a king, and in your sleeping rooms, do not curse a rich man, for a bird of the heavens will carry the sound, and the winged creature will make the matter known. So even before the internet and iPhones and listening devices and telephones and tapped wires, even the birds of the air could carry your secrets to the throne. So bite your tongue. And don't assume that because something bad is happening, that did it something bad. This is the thing. You curse the king, but when you curse the king, it's in your own short-sightedness. This cannot be from wisdom. It cannot be from wisdom that you're cursing whatever you dislike. The wise person says, this is what's happening. The wise person says, I'm going to stick to my convictions even though the king is yelling at me. I'm going to stick to what I understand to be wisdom and we'll let the Lord sort it out in the end. I'm going to accept what comes to me. I'm going to accept the rulers that I have around me. I'm going to accept the parameters that enclose my actions with the knowledge that God knows eternity and I can't. Right. So, you know, when you stare Pontius Pilate in the face and you're tempted to say, poor me, just remember God put him there and God is no dummy. So just go about your business and walk according to the Lord's instruction. Thanks very much, Dr. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Thanks, you too. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.